Room. Let's start by taking a look at the day's headlines. KT Corporation is continuing to repair its mobile and internet networks in Seoul after a fire at one of its buildings last weekend paralyzed the firm's communications. 27 EU leaders sign off on British Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit agreement. The deal will now require British lawmakers to approve it a task that's far from guaranteed. Plus, the weather is milder, but unfortunately, you'll need face masks at the ready. Yet another band of fine dust is choking large parts of South Korea. Our top story this morning, South Korea's top fixed line operator, KT Corporation, says it has repaired more than half the network damage that occurred after a fire broke out on Saturday at one of its buildings here in Seoul. The down networks have inconvenienced hundreds of thousands of people in the capital, but KT says it may take several more days to fully repair the damage. Lee Sung Jae starts us off. Saturday's fire at a KT building in Seoul's central Ion district was extinguished after 10 hours, with no casualties reported. But the property damage has been estimated at 7 million U.S. dollars. The blaze caused a mobile and network blackout for KT's customers, causing massive inconvenience to users. The operation of shops, including convenience stores and restaurants, were affected as the fire paralyzed their credit card payment systems that use KT's communication network. KT, along with local fire authorities, say it may take a week to fully repair the affected network as the company looks to minimize the inconvenience of its users. We're doing our best to minimize damage by restoring up to 90 percent of our service by Sunday evening. KT says it will provide compensation to its users. The firm says the compensation will be a full refund of one month's bill. KT also vowed to prevent similar cases happening again in the future. The company is still carrying out an investigation with the fire authorities to find out the cause of the fire. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Now, if you're watching us in Korea and take a look out the window, what you see behind me might be somewhat of a familiar scene. While South Korea will enjoy a milder day than average at this time of year on this Monday, parts of the nation are unfortunately blanketed with fine dust. Korea's central region, including Seoul and the surrounding metropolitan area, is suffering from bad fine dust levels as we speak, uh, parts of the southern coast, including the city of Ulsan, are also seeing high levels of fine dust as well. Other areas, though, are expected to be just average. Last week, the UN Security Council agreed to partially waive its sanctions on North Korea for a project to reconnect and modernize its railways with those in the south. Now, the US has also granted an exemption to its own sanctions for the project to actually start moving ahead now. Sources in the South Korean government told Yonhap News Agency on the condition of anonymity that the sanctions waiver from Washington has been finalized in talks with Seoul. The US has imposed unilateral sanctions on North Korea in addition to those by the UN which ban the transfer of refined petroleum products to the north, something that would be needed. Uh, for this project to plough forward. The two Koreas are expected to break ground on the railway project in the coming days. EU leaders have backed British Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit agreement in a summit in Brussels that lasted a mere half an hour or so. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn, as we like to do, to our Noah Adam. So, Adam, just the sceptical British Parliament left to convince. That's right, Mark, and it will be the toughest test for Prime Minister uh, May. Many MPs from both sides of the aisle have already said they will vote down the deal. However, EU leaders are urging British lawmakers to approve the agreement, saying there is no alternative. 
I'm inviting those who have uh, to ratify this deal in the House of Commons to take this in consideration. This is the best deal possible for Britain. This is the best deal possible for Europe. This is the only deal possible. The only deal uh, possible. Mr Juncker also warned that anyone who thought the EU may offer improved terms would be disappointed. Mrs May also used the post-summit press conference in Brussels to make a sales pitch for her plan. Before Christmas, MPs will vote on this deal. It will be one of the most significant votes that Parliament has held for many years. On it will depend whether we move forward together into a brighter future or open the door to yet more division and uncertainty. In Parliament and beyond it, I will make the case for this deal with all my heart and I look forward to that campaign. Brexiteers in the UK have complained that the agreement binds Britain to too many EU rules, with London having no say. After the summit, many MPs were unconvinced and repeated their willingness to vote the deal down. Despite the prospects of May's plan looking dim, there was no discussion of what may happen if Parliament rejects the deal. Russia has opened fire on Ukrainian ships and captured three vessels in a major escalation of tensions off the coast of Crimea. Three sailors have been wounded after the Ukrainian Navy said two gunboats were hit by the strikes in the Black Sea. Both countries have blamed each other for the incident. The crisis began when Russia accused the Ukrainian ships of illegally entering its waters. Russia placed a tanker under a bridge in the Kerch Strait to block the Ukrainian vessels from entering the Sea of Azov. Ukraine said it had informed the Russians of its plan to move its ships through. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko has called an emergency session of his so-called war cabinet amid reports that martial law could be imposed. The EU and NATO have called for restraint and urged Moscow to restore freedom of passage at the Kerch Strait. Meanwhile, Russia says it has carried out airstrikes against Syrian rebels it accuses of wounding more than 100 people in the city of Aleppo with a chemical attack. The Syrian government also blamed the rebels, showing images on state media of Aleppo residents being treated in hospital as they struggled to breathe. The rebels denied the allegations, saying Moscow and Damascus are using the claims as a pretext for an attack on opposition-held areas. There had been no major offensive in northern Syria since September when Russia and Turkey, which backs the rebels, agreed to create a buffer zone to separate government forces from rebel fighters in Idlib province. Firefighters in California say the deadly wildfire that tore through the United States, uh, the U.S. state, over the past two weeks has been completely contained. The so-called campfire was both the deadliest and the most destructive fire in California's history. At least 85 people have been killed and more than 270 people remain unaccounted for. 154,000 acres in Northern California have been scorched with nearly 14,000 homes destroyed. Rain hit the area last week, helping to contain the fire, but adding to challenges in recovery efforts. Thank you, as always, to our Noah Adam for the world news there. Now, uh, closer to home, the South Korean government and the ruling Democratic Party has announced a new set of measures to reduce credit card transaction fees to lessen the financial burden on small business owners. After a meeting Monday, officials from the Financial Services Commission and the ruling party said they looked into the cost of credit card transaction fees and found they could save up to 1.2 billion US dollars in costs. They said the amount will be reduced in a way that will mainly benefit the self-employed and small businesses. Credit card transaction fees for small business owners who register above some $440,000 in yearly sales will be cut from the current 2.05% to just 1.4%. Those who register sales above $880,000 will see their fees drop to 1.6% from the current 2.21%. 
Beginning next year, life prolonging treatment for terminally ill patients in South Korea will become much more practical with a narrower, narrower scope of family consent. The measure is expected to grant the right to die with dignity to more patients who have no chance of overcoming their illness. Kim Hyo Sun reports. The South Korean government will ease regulations on ending life-sustaining treatment for those who are terminally ill starting early next year. Under the current law, life-sustaining treatment for unconscious patients can only be halted with the consent of all of their lineal family members, including their spouse, parents, children and grandchildren. The scope of life-sustaining treatment should be expanded from the current four treatments, CPR, use of respirators, or anti-cancer drugs, and hemodialysis. According to the Ministry of Health and Welfare on Sunday, the National Assembly passed an amendment that allows patients to end medical treatment after getting consent from their spouse, parents, or children, which will take effect from March 28th next year. Going forward, the ministry also aims to expand the scope of unnecessary medical treatment to include blood transfusions and the use of vasopressors. Since the current law took effect in February this year, over 20,000 patients chose to halt life-prolonging treatment as of early October. The easing of regulations is expected to give patients the right to die with dignity and reduce the use of unnecessary medical treatment. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Temple Stay is a unique chance for people to experience and learn about Korean Buddhism and its culture. The program, which is something you can only try in Korea, is high on many foreigners' to-do list while they're here as well. Our Sobobin takes us to experience Temple Stay. Not far from Seoul is the city of Hwasong in Gyeonggi-do province. It's the perfect location for seeing the vibrant colors of autumn and winter scenery. This is Yongjusa Temple in Hwasong. With a history dating back 1,700 years, the Temple Stay program offers a monastic lifestyle for visitors looking to take a break from their busy lives. Temple Stay allows participants to experience a monk's lifestyle and learn about Korean Buddhism and its culture. The temple runs its own program allowing participants ways to find their inner self. Through the program, we learn about temple etiquette, the importance of food through the practice of eating, and there's also the 108 prostration to help participants find self-esteem in their inner self. From around 3 p.m., visitors start to filter into the temple. What brings foreigners to participate in the Temple Stay program? It turns out, a lot of international students are interested in learning about Korean Buddhism. I really want to explore the culture in every single way. So one way is to explore uh, Buddhism here uh, in the temple and to really see how uh, the, the monks are living and the practices of Buddhism, which I know is quite big in Korea. People come to the temple for different personal reasons. By coming here, they can learn about temple etiquettes, Buddha's learnings, and be a part of Korea's culture of Buddhism. As the sun sets, it's time for dinner. Temple food prohibits any meat, therefore it provides a healthy and clean meal. In Buddhism, the practice of eating, or the offering, is part of learning discipline and being grateful for the food given. By understanding this, participants take an appropriate portion of food in their bowls. It makes me think about food waste a lot, and I think I'll be more careful to, you know, just eat everything that I buy and prepare. The next day at dawn, participants take part in Yebur, a ceremony of praising Buddha by performing 108 prostrations. The 108 prostrations represent the sufferings that people experience, and although it isn't easy, the visitors do their best. By doing this, they experience a moment of enlightenment and feel an inner calm. Finally, the participants walk up the mountain in silence to connect with nature and find their inner self. Their two days at the temple are now over, and it's time for the participants to go back to their daily life. Well, I try to take away some, um, that I can have some moments for me as well uh, during my daily life, and as well to enjoy the moments maybe a bit more. 
Away from the hustle and bustle of urban life, the Temple Stay program provides a chance to find your true self. Come and be mesmerized by the temple's breathtaking scenery and learn more about the common piece of Korean Buddhism. Sobobin, Arirang News, Hwasong. Now, shirim, or Korean traditional wrestling, is a fun hobby for regular people, while professionals test their strength and technique in high-pressure tournaments. From last Tuesday all the way to this Monday, today's the final day, the 2018 Korea Shiram Festival is being held in the city of Andong in southeastern South Korea, with competitors showing off their various talents. Our Che Young went to check it out and files this report. In Korean, the winner of a Shirum festival is called Chana Jangsa, or the strongest person under the heavens. It's the highest honor in the sport. The Korea Shirum festival was held from 1983 until 2004 before it was briefly discontinued and revived by the Korea Shirum Association in 2008. The festival this year brought together about a thousand wrestlers and staff. The event is divided into separate tournaments for men, women, college students, and foreign invitees. From overseas, there was a total of 42 wrestlers from China, Mongolia, Russia, Spain, and New Zealand. The title of Chana Jangsa is awarded separately for men and women. Players not vying for the title compete against peers of the same sex according to their weight class, of which there are three, flyweight, lightweight, and middleweight. The title of Chana Jangsa is awarded only once a year, and for men, we should know who the winner is by Monday afternoon. Meanwhile, the sport of Shirim has a good chance of being listed as one of UNESCO's intangible cultural assets. A month ago, the UNESCO's evaluation body recommended that it be put on the list. The final decision will be made during an intergovernmental session held in Mauritius from November 26 to December 1st. Cha Xiong, Arirang News. The movie Bohemian Rhapsody is continuing to do remarkably well in South Korean cinemas, surpassing four million ticket sales over the weekend. According to the Korean Film Council, the movie's ticket sales as of Sunday were over 4.2 million. It added the movie is forecast to surpass the 5 million mark before the end of its run at local cinemas. Named after one of the greatest hits, from the band Queen, the movie depicts the life of the band's flamboyant frontman Freddie Mercury. The song Bohemian Rhapsody is also among the top downloaded songs on several music sites here in South Korea. Now, using a smartphone to call over a self-driving car and traveling to your destination without getting behind the wheel or having anyone behind the wheel is no longer a scene from a science fiction movie. It's going to be very soon part of our daily lives, perhaps. Park Se-young has this report. When this carpooling commuter selects a car from a smartphone app, a self-driving car shortly arrives at the caller's location. Current law requires a backup driver to be present in the vehicle, but he does not control the wheel. SK Telecom and Korea's Transport Ministry have trialed self-driving cars that can answer customers' calls. The cars pick up riders in the order of calls and take them to their destinations. Once that's done, the cars head to their next call or automatically return to a nearby parking lot. System reforms for self-driving cars and car-sharing services are needed before the technology can be commercialized. A lot of things need to be done before self-driving cars are commercialized. One of them is 5G connectivity. Transportation and communication have to be linked, and insurance and self-driving technologies have to evolve. Because both self-driving cars and car-sharing services are run on communication networks, measures to prevent hacking are also important. Park Se-young, Arirang News. Now, staying with tech news, South Korea recently opened a new research lab specializing in primates, which will help local scientists to develop new medicines, treatments and drugs uh, for human beings. Jo Sung-min reports. South Korea has a new primate research center located in Cholabukdo province. The Korea Research Institute of Bioscience and Biotechnology, which runs the center, 
says it's the nation's biggest facility of its kind and can support up to 3,000 monkeys. The primates are used for various clinical tests since nearly 94% of their DNA structure matches that of humans. That said, tests involving monkeys have resulted in some groundbreaking medical discoveries in the past and contributed to the development of treatments for various diseases. Until now, South Korea has had to buy monkeys from abroad for research, at least 650 of them every year. But the new facility makes it possible for the country to supply its own. This facility is built to provide monkeys for various tests conducted by local researchers. It is also responsible for the raising of monkeys in case there is a need to export them in the future. The center said it will contribute to the discovery of new medicines for illnesses for which there is still no cure. It also said they are trying to have at least 1,000 monkeys there by the end of this year and in the long term, about 3,000 by 2025. Cho Sung-min, Arirang News. Good morning. We had a chilly morning to start the day, but temperatures will go rise higher than yesterday and we'll have milder temperatures than last week. And as Mark said, central regions of Korea, including Seoul, will be covered with ultra-fine dust. So make sure you keep your face covered at all times. And expect to have a fairly sunny Monday in most regions. But Jeju Island will see light rainfall in the afternoon, but still quite mild at a high of 18 degrees, while Seoul will be topping out at 13 degrees. With that, let's take a look at the international weather for viewers around the world. So dusty and dry weather with bearable temperatures are store for most of South Korea today. Many parts of North Korea will be under partly sunny skies. Japan is expected to experience average to warmer weather between December and February. Meanwhile, Wellington sees rain with heavy falls possible and expect to see showers until Thursday. Heading to North America, a blizzard warning was issued Sunday for much of the Chicago area and expect another cold start to the new week. As for South America, Bogota and Rio de Janeiro will have unstable weather conditions. Taking you to Europe, Britain will be hit with another storm this week, replacing bees from the east with strong gusts and rain from the west. Lastly to Africa, Cape Town will have windy and cloudy start to the new week. And that's the weather update for now. Well, on that peaceful note, that's where we're going to leave it for now. Do stay tuned to Arirang TV. We will have uh, more news for you coming up at noon Korea time with our very own E.G. Yoon. So until then, goodbye.